Forty years ago, four special economic zones were established in South China. Today, Shenzhen, Zhuhai, Shantou, and Xiamen have become an important part of the story of China's reform and opening up. From a tiny fishing village to China's Silicon Valley, Shenzhen is even on its way to becoming a global model metropolis. How did the country's earliest special economic zones come into being? What changes have they brought to China? And how will their success be continued? To talk about these issues and more, I'm joined by He Weiwen, senior fellow with the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at Renmin University, Mr. Hong Weimin, principal liaison officer for Hong Kong with the Shenzhen Tianhai Authority, Professor Hai uh, Haifeng Wu from the Shenzhen Finance Institute of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and Mara Kovolo, Senior Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Zhou Yun. Uh, let me start with you, Mr. He. Uh, many international media call Shenzhen China's proudest symbol of the last 40 years of economic reforms. So, in what way it symbolizes China's reform that started 40 years ago? Uh, I think the foreign media's uh, the comments is very accurate. Shenzhen really is the pace setter for China's reform and the opening up over the past 40 years. Because we lacked experiences from the very beginning, we had to start from a very small plot of land, from a very small place to start to explore the way pathways. And Shenzhen has been proved very successful. And later, the experiences of Shenzhen was ex amplified to other parts of China and pushed China forward over the past 40 years. So Shenzhen deserves the, uh, the name of the pace setter for China's reform and opening up over the past 40 years. Uh, Mr. Hong, uh, actually before the success story of Shenzhen, there were Asian uh, tigers, uh, four Asian tigers. In the process of modernization, a lot of different countries have experienced economic reforms and opening up. But different approaches have been taken. Uh, in, in the case of China, why did China uh, setting up special economic zones as the way for uh, manufacturing and industrialization? Well, we have to understand at that time, 1978-79, China was a totally planned economy according to the old, uh, you know, uh, Russian style. And then to, for it to reform, and so China is such a large country, it's very difficult. You know, any, any kind of changes that affects the whole country is very highly unpredictable. That's why I think that's why they, they draw these four small circles in the south of China, four yeah. cities. Uh, you know, Shenzhen is towards Hong Kong, Shantou uh, is towards overseas Chinese, Xiamen is uh, towards the Taiwanese, and then the uh, Zhuhai towards uh, Macau to try the reform and opening up uh, so that um, if it has any adverse effects, it will only be contained within the small city there. And then also, because it's very far away from the centers of China, i.e. Beijing or Shanghai, um, they can try some new things. They can try things that is totally against the old status quo. And this is what, what exactly what they did. And Professor Wu, about those four choices, Shenzhen, Zhuhai, Shantou, and Xiamen, they obviously have treaded a different path over the past 40 years. So how did they make the choices of those four cities, and what is your assessment of their different development pathway? I believe all the cities have their own kind of strategies. For example, Shenzhen, they're focusing on the high-tech manufacturing business, manufacturing kind of industries, they've done quite well. And uh, Zhuhai, they also, I mean, try to utilize the, 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 the capital and the, the facilities, established facilities on the, on the, on the home, home, homemade kind of the, the, the goods, and they also play well. And Xiamen, obviously, it is quite successful stories because it's close to, to the Taiwan, and it's become a very famous tourism cities. And Shantou, they actually contribute lots of the business talents to the wild Chinese markets. So all the cities, they've done quite well in the past four years. Uh, 
Mario, uh, I know that you've been living in northern China for uh, a lot, uh, qu quite some time. But uh, did you know the city of Shenzhen back 40 years ago? Thanks, Zoye. I noticed there was some audio difficulty. Thanks for switching over to me. Great to be here. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite familiar with the whole country. I'm in the north now, but I spent many, many years in Shanghai. Uh, I never lived in Shenzhen, but frequently went there for business. It's the remarkable, it's the remarkable fishing village to incredible high-tech zone city. Uh, you know, we can easily understand how it would be regarded as the pace setter. And from my point of view as someone quote, representing other cities in Shenyang, why I'm on the show this evening, it's to recognize that the things that Shen Shenzhen did set the stage for that to be duplicated again in so many other cities successfully across China. It's been incredible. And Mr. He, uh, 40 years ago, we called those four areas special economic zones. Uh, in what way they are special? I think they are special in many ways. Uh, in appearance, people used to <coughs> think that special economic zones means they have tax rebates and tax incentives and many, many free facilities. But actually, the special economic zones means a special means a special system of government management towards economy. Because in that during that time China was a planned economy and the SOEs predominated in the economic life. So if we want to grow, if we want to develop, we must open the door and uh, bring in the foreign capital investment and foreign technology experiences and also to try to open the foreign market. So we have to change the economic system. So in that way, Shenzhen Economic Zone, a special economic zone, has many pilot experiences. For instance, the land bidding to transfer land use, that's not happened in other parts of the country. And then to set up shareholding companies, not SOEs. And then we have foreign banks branches in Shenzhen. For instance, the Nanyang Commercial Bank, to set a branch in Shenzhen. This is impossible in other parts of the country. So in this way, we opened with the, for, the with international market and uh, incorporate with the world economy. But uh, why didn't we open up our country all at once? Why we need to uh, run some experiments in some chosen areas? Could you please give us a, a sense of the historical context? Uh, Yes, uh, of course. Uh, yes, we because at that time we had no experience. If we open the whole country at once, there will be total failure. Which, uh, so as just as Bob Deng Xiaoping said, we had to fill the stone when we crossed the river. So step by step, we first opened the four special economic zones in the south, three in Guangdong, one in Fujian. Fujian, Xiamen is facing Taiwan, and Guangdong, two, Shenzhen, Zhuhai are facing Hong Kong and Macau and uh, Santo because Santo is a center for many Caozhou overseas Chinese. So we have that facility and also they have a very good commercial business culture historically. So that's the first group for opening up. Then a few years later in 1984, the central government decided to open 14 cities along the east coast from Dalian all the way to Beihai. Then there's a second lot and then in 1988, we opened the Hainan, the whole island, as special economic zone. Then in 1990, we opened Pudong as a very small, as a major part for opening up. So, and then we have different uh, special treatment in different parts of the provinces. So step by step, we grew the economy, accumulated experiences, and made it very stable and successful. It is indeed an incremental growth for all those uh, pilot zones. Mr. Holm, uh, but in the beginning, there were some policies and even measures were pretty controversial because uh, back then they were called capitalist characteristics. Uh, 
Could you please, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, could you please uh, give us some perspectives on what happened back then, the debate about socialism and capitalism, and is it still relevant today? Okay. Well, uh, in the early days, as you know, um, when they first opened up uh, Shenzhen and Shikou, um, there are various things. I, I remember reading this story about paying bonuses at the end of the year to construction workers in Shikou. Now, that was regarded as a capitalist move. Okay, it get escalated all the way up to vice premier at that level at that time, so to decide that it's actually uh, legal to do such things. Remember, we used to have a crime called speculation. Okay, Toji Daoba. It was only removed from the uh, criminal law in 1997. But before that, already in Shenzhen, that, we, we see people trading, in right? Yeah, speculation in English. So, so in, in 1997, they removed it from the uh, 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 criminal law. But before that, in the special economic zone, we, are, we have people that does trading. Now, trading could easily be related as a speculation. So, you know, all that with hindsight today, of course, first of all, I do not think it's a contrast between capitalism and communism or socialism. It's more about market economy and planet economy. As the Chinese government now clearly stated, it is market economy with, you know, socialist uh, market economy, which is what we have in China right now. And obviously, all these kind of market-driven activities are all legal now. Um, and other things such as property, um, you know, titles of property. Of course, uh, even in the early days of Shenzhen, you, you cannot gain title, but you, have, you can gain the right of use. But even that, at that time, was classified as very strange things. It's not illegal, but it's just unthinkable uh, to saying um, you are leasing, let's say, a piece of land to some foreign investors or Hong Kong investors for a period of 30 years or 40 years. That was, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's illegal, but it's just highly controversial at that time. Mm. And, and Professor Wu, uh, uh, there are s many factors that are at play for Shenzhen's success, and, and the other three. Uh, market uh, competition, foreign investment, manufacturing incentives, government's uh, support. Uh, what would you say the most important one? I think the most important one is we let the market to decide the important part for all the successful cities among the in, within the China. So, for example, at the very beginning stage of opening up, every city, all the nearly all the all the open cities, they try different preferential preferential kind of policies to try to incentivize the business and incentivize the markets. But in the end of days, when you see the different cities, right, the Shenzhen among the best. Because in the end of the day, they let the market decide where the results should, be, should go and where the government should be care about. So I believe that the market-driven kind of the, the economy system are the most important critical point to make a city become successful. Uh, Other than relying on the on policies, yes. Mario, policy is very important. Mario, what is yes. your take? Uh, what, what is your takeaway from Shenzhen's success? My takeaway from Shenzhen's success is to recognize how the early experiment needed to happen in a limited way. I mean, that's common sense in business, right? You test the waters, you see how it goes, you gauge, you adjust, you keep moving forward, you expand. This was very wise thinking. And then, sure enough, we see it all over the rest of the country. I mean, for example, here in Shenyang, so many other cities are now able to look at those successful models. This is good business. Create a successful model. Well, create a model. Prove that it's successful, and then you're able to roll it out and duplicate it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And Shenyang is a magnificent city. It started, you know, Shenzhen started out as a fishing village. Shenyang started out in, you know, high pollution manufacturing. But look now, we have uh, BBA, BMW here. We have the Huinan, uh, Kaifachi, the Huinan New Zone, also the high-tech zone. 
we have the New World Exhibition Center up in Shenyang. Most people don't realize so many great things are happening here in Shenyang. And in many of the other chosen second tier cities, for what purpose? For them all, Zoye, to become first tier cities. And we see China as well on its way to accomplishing that. Yeah. And Mr. He, it seems this has become a pattern that Chinese want to do things by trial and error, testing things out in small places, then expand to other places. But uh, into the new uh, era, China later established some new special zones. For example, Pudong, new area, Xiong'an, new area, Beibu Bay, economic zone, Hainan Free Trade Port. Are these new pilot schemes uh, carried the same weight as those 40 years ago? No, definitely not. Now, the newly designed uh, uh, economic zones, or special economic zones, are uh, starting at a much higher starting point than Shenzhen. When Shenzhen started 40 years ago, it was uh, originally meant to attract foreign investment, to set up factories, and then export. Then Shenzhen grew further and further to bring in the foreign capital and the foreign banking, and then move up the ladder to high tech. That's a step by step. But Pudong started on a much higher plateau. It started as the center for international trade, for international finance, and also for high tech development. And the Xiong'an is quite different from Pudong. Xiong'an is just by side of the, of the capital, and it will create a completely different model for development. I think that all these should be very helpful and complementary for making China a great country again. And Mr. Hong, uh, during an inspection tour of the Chinese president in 2012, uh, Mr. Xi said the reforms had to be deepened in Shenzhen. And Shenzhen officials hit on the idea of the city becoming China's Silicon Valley. Do you think? Shenzhen will become China's Silicon Valley, or is it already China's Silicon Valley? Uh, it is already China's Silicon Valley. In fact, it's even, uh, you know, deeper than that, because uh, I've talked to my friends in the Silicon Valley. If you have something designed in the lab, you know, can you find somewhere to manufacture it? Not easy in Silicon Valley. Whereas here in Shenzhen and also with the neighbor cities of Dongguan and Huizhou, it's much easier for you f to find anything on the supply chain in a very short period of time at a very low cost. So it is the maker's paradise, as they call it uh, in the States. This is where the real um, Silicon Valley of um, China is. And I think there is some lessons to be learned there. Um, one side, obviously, President Xi talked about deepening the reform, which is still ongoing in various areas. And one of the areas is the role of the government in terms of vis-a-vis -vis the market. If you look at the success story of Shenzhen, most of the successful enterpri uh, enterprises in Shenzhen are privately owned. We have Huawei, we have CTE, we have BYD, uh, all these, you know, Tencent, of course. Um, they are all private companies. So what? did the Shenzhen government do um, to help? So instead of picking the winners, what they do is they award the winners. They support people, try and error, they support the young, you know, s startups. But once you're successful, they give you tax incentives so that you can grow. And I think that is a real model that could be learned by the other um, special zones because we, we have preferential policies all in different zones in China, but they're different kind of preferential policies. Tax incentives on one side, but also there are grants, there are investment. But Shenzhen somehow play in a, such a nice way integrated. They also have one of these uh, largest government-owned venture capital uh, uh, in, in Shenzhen as well that were very successful not only investing in enterprises in Shenzhen, but also investing in other cities of China where they incubate those small tech startups, and then move them to Shenzhen. And we've also collected some opinions from social media users about Shenzhen and what does Shenzhen mean for China. Let's take a look at what some of them have been saying. Uh, this social media user said, over the past 40 years, Shenzhen has attracted a large number of entrepreneurs and companies. 
And in other words, uh, data show there were 159 companies for every thousand people that translated into every 10 people will have a boss in Shenzhen. That means a private business people. The density of entrepreneurship ranks first in the country. So, Professor Wu, uh, my question is, as Mr. Hong just mentioned, uh, obviously Shenzhen is a city that encouraging entrepreneurship and private businesses. Uh, but is it, uh, does it have national uh, significance and relevance? Because obviously China still has a very large uh, state-owned sector. Uh, where should we uh, look at uh, for the economic incentives? Is it the state-led sector or is it the private businesses? I think the sector are to the, to the economic models. For example, state sectors, they are primarily in the sector of energies, power, utilities, which provide, provide essential kind of the goods to the publics, and sometimes those services running on the, on, the, on the losses. So for the private sector, they force them to do those kind of the utility services. They actually not willing, to, willing too much to do those kind of things. But for the state-owned company, because they have a task, they can do that. They can provide, keep the, the cost of living, cost of the living standard, be lower. So that is the, 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 the contribution for the state-owned company. On the other hand, the private company actually they increase the productivity of the economic growth, right? So for because private company they have very kind of the standard for the for the performance, standard performance standards. So you have to make the performance, keep them sharp, keep them competitive either in the domestic market as well as in the global market, so make them quite sharp, make them quite com competitive this compared to other countries. So that is a task for the private company. So both sectors, public owned or state owned company and the private company, they are all important to make this economic growth model more sustainable and replicatable in the future. And there is an international uh, aspect of this. Uh, Mario, you are American. Of course, the Americans have been complaining a lot about the economic makeup uh, in China. Uh, they say that the state tax sector is still too strong. They should need to reform the state-owned enterprises. But often, they ignore that the private businesses is also a big chunk of the Chinese economy and where a lot of the economic entrepreneurship and, and drives come from. So what do you say to the American criticism about the Chinese economic incentives? Uh, me? Uh, well, that's Mario. right, Zoye. The entrepreneurship side here is incredible. Let, let, let's go back. And you mentioned about the Asian tigers first, right, where we were looking at uh, Japan, Thailand, Korea, uh, Singapore, I think, or Malaysia, and they were building up manufacturing with government support. Okay, and then we moved to China, and we had fishing village Shenzhen, and building up into a high-tech area with what? With government support. So we had government-supported uh, market, we had mar a market economy, but we had a planned economy with government support. In all cases, government was involved. So there wasn't 100% free market capitalism. There was an issue, which was the SOEs. But for example, look at uh, Mayor Zhang Youwei here in Shenyang. He's done great reforms in SOEs. And there's been SOE reform. Do we need more? Sure we need more. All of it has led to what? More and more a focus away from the SOEs to these economic zones than to uh, other zones, like I mentioned, the, the high-tech zones, the software parks locally. In, uh, the, the Singapore park in Suzhou, another great model for the international community, very successful. All of it leading to what? More and more down the funnel toward the individual entrepreneurs. And I want to say real quickly, now what can an SME do? An SME can start a business with very little cost, a few thousand RMB, doesn't need to put a hundred thousand or half a million or a million of, of registered capital in to start their business. So now China is encouraging individual entrepreneurship, even with things like WeChat and Alipay, which help support small businesses, and even the incentives that the government offers, such as right now having a hundred thousand RMB uh, a month in revenue, your first hundred thousand is exempt from that, uh, from the 3% sales tax. So, yeah, we're seeing the funnel go down, down, down to the individual entrepreneurs, and that's an enormous part of Chinese society. Uh, let's also talk about the um, nearby cities of Shenzhen. Uh, 
Of course, Mr. Hong, we know that uh, there was a grand scheme called the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, which means better integration of all those areas surrounding uh, uh, Hong Kong, Macau, and Guangdong. But uh, there are some criticism about whether the integration will happen seamlessly as people would expect it. What, what do you think it is in the way? Oh, I think it's doing all right. Of course, there will be competition. Um, I actually tour around the uh, area quite often, and I published a book on the GBA last year. Um, yes, uh, you know, cities like Dongguan, they are moving up the ladder. They are learning. They are getting, for example, Huawei have moved its uh, manufacturing plants to Dongguan. Okay. You can see on one side there seems to be a competition, but on the other side it's actually to free up the space in um, Shenzhen so Huawei can do their R&D there. I think there is a competition, but there's also cooperation. Um, at the end of the day, um, what formed the GBA today, it was not totally by plan. It was more a market forces. Okay, when Fenbin become too expensive, factories moved to Dongguan, moved to Huizhou. When Guangzhou became too expensive, factories moved to Fosan. Okay, it, it's like that. And then the industry's focus is a little bit different as well. Of course, everybody wants to do the real mm. high value added um, finance and things like that, but my take is none of them can do it anyway. Okay, at the end of the day, and everybody was talking about high-tech manufacturing and modern manufacturing. They are doing that, but with different focuses. For example, Shenzhen is doing a lot of telecommunications because mm. they have Huawei and ZTEs. Dongguan is now moving to robots, robotics and drones because DJI is there. Zhongshan is moving towards a lot of um, health and you know uh, 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 this kind of related equipment for the health industry and because they already had a history there. They also have a Hong Kong U uh, joint venture there with the Hong Kong University of Hong Kong. Mm. So each one is trying to pick their best thing to develop instead of trying to uh, compete on all fronts. Which you they you mentioned anyway. Hong Kong because actually Shenzhen's took off was on the back of Hong Kong's success. Many manufacturing businesses moved to Shenzhen and also investment came also. But 40 years later, it seems Hong Kong is another story. Uh, where does Hong Kong fit in? I, I think it fit in very well. I mean, because we have a little bit of hurdle this past 12 months. Um, but if you look at what good Bay Area need now, today it doesn't really need the kind of investment or the kind of skill and technology from Hong Kong manufacturers, which most of them have already moved into the mainland anyway, okay, mm. not only to Guangdong, but to other part of China. However, Hong Kong today is the top professional service hub for the whole Bell and Road for that matter, not just for China, or not just for the GBA, but for whole Bell and Road. Okay, um, if you look at the regional development, we have Jingjingji, which is you know, near to Tianjin and Beijing, and that's really a lot of the SOEs, and that's really a different kind of model. Then you have the, 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 the Yangtze Delta had, you know, with Shanghai. There's a lot of foreign enterprises, foreign banks, foreign investment there. But here in the Guangdong, we have homegrown industries, okay, whether it's Huawei, whether it's all these domestic appliance manufacturers in Zhongshan and Fosan, these big brands. Now, these people, they are homegrown local companies. Now they want to go out. They want to go out and invest. They want to go out and do financing. They want to go IPO. They're going to do merge and acquisition in different parts of the world. Hong Kong plays the role of the professional service hub for these things. Okay, Hong Kong's professionals, both in finance and legal and, you know, accounting, um, um, project management, uh, visibility studies, you name it. All these things, we have professionals that have, for example, on one side, they can speak the language, they understand um, the situation in Thai China, where the culture is a bit different from the rest part of the world. On the other hand, our standards, our laws, right. and our way uh, of professional training is, you know, in, in one word, the Western Hong Kong well. still matters, although Shenzhen catches up. I, I have to leave, uh, leave it there. Thank you very much, Mr. Hong. Thank you, Professor Shen. Okay. And, and, and thank you, Mario. And thank you, uh, Mr. Ho. You've been watching Dialogue here on CGTN. I'm doing Beijing. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.